All right, so now we'll continue our discussion of spatial mechanisms, but we'll talk about how to represent them because we had recognized there are so many different joint types and so many different ways we can put together these spatial mechanisms that it can be challenging to represent them. So we need a, 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 a formulation, if you will, and what we're going to use are what, called, are what are called DH parameters, or Denovit and Hartenberg parameters. And this is a generalized format that's used very often in robotics literature, but we can also apply it to closed chain mechanisms that we often use in the mechanism world. So, how do we define these DH parameters? First of all, let me just start off with a couple of joints, and we will really just set up coordinate systems to represent these. So I have a coordinate system that has a rotation about the z-axis, so all of our rotations or translations will be about z, and you'll notice that I have z sub i and then I have z sub i plus 1 and z sub i minus 1. So we represent all of these coordinate transformations with respect to the joints that are right next door, which would be the z sub i minus 1 and i plus 1. So how do we do this? We set up a few conventions here. First is that we're going to number all of our joints consecutively, starting at the input. So we can have all of our joints, we'll number them, and then we'll choose our joint um, axes such that our x's are perpendicular to the previous z and the current z. So you'll notice that x sub, um, x sub i, which is right here, this is perpendicular to the current z, which is z sub i, and z sub i minus 1. So that is perpendicular to both of those two. And then we're going to set up the, the origins um, such that the origin will be fixed in the link that has the, um, the joints i minus 1 and i. And so the, all of these x, y, z's will be fixed in that link that carried the previous joint as well as the current joint. And then the final thing is that once we go to this closed chain, we're going to have joint 1 reference the very last joint. So if it's a 4-bar mechanism, we'd have joint 1 referencing joint 4 and move around our mechanism that way. All right, so this is not simple, but you do a little bit of practice and it becomes, becomes a little bit easier to do. Now, how do we describe the, the uh, basically taking one coordinate system, moving it to the next one, as well as any variables that we have in our mechanism? What we use are a set of four parameters, and two of these can be variables, which happen to be rotation about the z-axis, which we represent with theta, as well as translation along the z-axis, which we represent with s. So the a and the alpha um, variables, we use, simply, we use those simply to get from one coordinate system to the other, whereas the other two can be variables. So you'll notice that we first of, have, first of, all, first of all have a distance along the x of i plus 1, and then we have an angle from one z to the other, so basically rotation about the x, sub i plus 1. And then we have the theta sub i plus 1, and this is um, basically rotation about z. And then we finally have translation along z, which is the s. So with all of that said, I think it's easiest to see how this all comes together in an example. So let's do an example of this. And this happens to be a, a serial uh, robot where I've got a few different joints here. I first of all have a, a revolute joint, which is about this, let me get my laser pointer, which is about this z naught axis. So that's this vertical axis here, and, and we're able to have a revolute joint represented by theta 1 here. Our next revolute is this axis right here, which is represented by z1. And then finally, we, another revolute right here with z2. And you notice that we have z3 then pointing out along this axis here, which might allow us to have a prismatic joint that is traveling along there, or perhaps another revolute that maybe is a wrist joint or something else. But we're, we're not representing that at the moment. Instead, we have three joints we're going to pay attention to. So let's use these DH parameters to describe this mechanism. So starting off here, um, what I'm going to do is create this table down here. And this table will basically be saying, as I move from as I have joint 0 moving from link 0 to link 1, how do I describe the, the a, the alpha, the theta, and the s? So that's what I want to define. And then once I have all those, I'll put those into a 4x4 a four four matrix that we'll talk about in just a moment. So let me start off and start to define these. So first of all, I look at the a. And the a is the, the distance along x from the uh, current, uh, I'm sorry, from the previous z to the next z. So as I look, I've got z0, and I've got z1, and I notice that as I, as I go from one to the other, I really have no distance between them because 
they are intersecting. So the distance along x1, you'll notice that x1 is intersecting both z0 and z1, so this value would be 0. And we find that quite often we can get a lot of these, also, uh, a lot of these in our dh parameters to be 0. Now our alpha angle, this is the angle that is the, the rotation from z sub i to i plus 1. So we're going from z0 to z1. So this is the rotation about x1. So I use a right-hand rule where I put my thumb down x1, and I look at the rotation from uh, z0, which is pointed up in this case, to z1, which is pointed the other way. So I could look at it as a 270-degree rotation or a minus 90-degree rotation. And that's why it's important to be you know, paying attention to the right-hand rule that the, the direction is important. So this will be a minus 90 degrees. And then we look at theta, which is the uh, angle of rotation here. And this is the angle of rotation about z0. And in this case, we're representing this with what's labeled as theta 1. And the way that we're measuring this is from z, I'm sorry, x0 to x1. So x0 in this case is pointing off into the right. x1 is pointing, you know, to the, to the left, sort of, and so it would be about 90 degrees as where it is drawn right now. And finally, we have s, which is the distance along z from the previous x to the, the x plus 1. So that's this vertical distance from x0 down here up to x1. That vertical distance is labeled d1. So that would be the dh parameters for, for that case. Now, as we look at this going from now um, 1 to 2, now we can do the same thing where a is the distance along x2 in this case. So we look at how far are we traveling along x2. x2 is out here. And so we're traveling from z1 out to z2 along that distance right there. And that is labeled as L2. So we have a distance L2. And then we look at what is the alpha rotation. And this is what is the rotation um, of z to, from one z to the next, and both of these z's happen to be parallel, so there is no rotation between these two. We look at the theta rotations, this is the joint angle, that's our variable in these revolute joints, so that is theta 2 as it's labeled. And again, paying attention to what is the angle here, that would be about minus 30 degrees, the way that it's drawn here, just for you to, to visualize it. And finally, the s variable, this is what is the distance along um, a z1 as I'm going from x1 to x2. So in this case, that distance is labeled as uh, d2. All right. So we've got all that information. So that's that distance d2 right there. Now, we've got all that information. Let's do this finally from going from uh, 2 to 3. And my a is the distance along um, x3. So I'm looking at x3 right here, which is pointed downwards. And because it's pointed downwards, I have no distance, so I have 0. Similarly, I have alpha, which is the uh, rotation from uh, z2 to z3. And my rotation here, my z2 is pointed off to the left. My z3 is pointed up and to the right. So I do have a rotation there of 90 degrees. And how do I figure that out? Well, I use my right-hand rule again and pay attention to which way am I which way am I rotating from z2 to z3, and I have my thumb pointed down x3, and I'm going from z2 to z3. So that's my 90 degrees of rotation. I have theta, which is my joint angle, theta 3, and this is approximately 120 degrees as it's drawn. And finally, I have s, and s is a value of 0 in this case because there is no distance along, um, along uh, z2 to get to um, the, the next coordinate system. So that's an example of filling out the DH parameters for these three revolute joints. We'll extend these out to some other types of mechanisms as well and treat some, some special cases that, that we'll have to deal with. But the one thing that I want you to remember is that we only use two different uh, uh, parameters here for our variables. Those are the theta angle, which is rotation about z, and our s, which is translation along z. Those are the only ones that can be variables. And so when we have to represent something like a spherical joint where we have three degrees of freedom, we set up three different z axes, a rotation about this one, we rotate it over, rotation about this one, we rotate it over, rotation about that. So that's how we represent the three degrees of freedom for something like that. All right, so what do we do with all these dh parameters? What we do is we take them and we ultimately put them into a four by four matrix, our coefficient matrix here. And the reason that we're going to do that is because 
we want to use these now to perform transformation matrix or transformations from one coordinate system to another. So what I mean by that? Well, first of all, this big transformation matrix, this T sub I to I plus one, it is enormous. It's a four by four, but you'll notice that what's built into that are the four DH parameters. That's all that's in there. And so one way that we often represent this, and this is just a, a representation, rep recognize that this is, this is not a, a matrix I'm writing, but instead it's just a representation. We often say this would be T sub I to I plus one, and then we have, um, often in parentheses, we would have A I to I plus one, and the same thing for alpha I to I plus one, same thing for uh, theta and then S. So theta and then S, and in both cases we'd be going from I to I plus one. So that's how we would represent that four by four matrix without having to write out the whole thing. Now, how we use this to jump from one coordinate system to another. Now, imagine that I know the coordinates of a point in the second coordinate system, but I want to bring them back into the first coordinate system. So what I do is I can simply write the matrix equation that says R1 is equal to the transformation matrix from T1 to T2, and that's that big four by four that you see on top there, multiplied by R2. And why this is useful is it allows us to jump from one coordinate system to the other, where I, if I know everything in coordinate system two, and just to, just to be clear here, this R2, this would be a, a, a coordinate system that would be X2, Y2, Z2, and one. And we could then multiply that by the four by four and get the, the coordinate system in um, R1 coordinate frame. So this allows us to jump around and do this quite quickly. Now, it's very useful for a serial chain when we have multiple links connected outwards, but it's even more useful in a closed chain like what we often have in the mechanisms that we design. Why is that? Well, let me jump over to a closed type of a mechanism, which would, or a closed chain type of mechanism, which would be a spherical joint. This one happens to be a universal joint, a special type of spherical mechanism. And this is a closed chain because we're connected back to ground on both sides where we have revolute joints that are rotating in ground on both sides. So we have a closed chain here. And why this is useful is that in our closed chain, we can say that R1 is equal to Rn, which is basically saying that the first and last positions are the same. And because of this, I can then use all of my transformation matrices to multiply this out and say R1 is equal to the transformation matrix T12 times T23 times however many we happen to have to Tn minus one um, to N and finally going to Tn back to the first one because we're going to uh, use the, the first one uh, with respect to the last one and multiply all of these by R1. And if that is true, which it has to be for a closed chain, then we can say that all of these transformation matrices multiplied together, these guys right here, these are all equal to the identity matrix, a four by four identity matrix, which again, a four by four would just be one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, and zero, 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 one. That would be our four by four identity matrix. So this is incredibly powerful to us when we are trying to do a position analysis or trying to do synthesis, but we can, because we can say all of these transformation matrices have to be, their product has to be equal to the identity matrix. And so from that, we can then back out what the individual terms could be because we can force them equal to zero or one based on that identity matrix. So very powerful. So DH parameters are a little bit difficult to get the hang of at first in that they have kind of a systematic set of rules. The first piece is that you set up where your coordinate systems are, and then you define what your DH parameters are that jump you from one coordinate system to the other and have your rotations and your translations along Z. And then you can use those in these transformation matrices. And we'll use this then for synthesis in class.